evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. Answering your questions tonight, former Cabinet Secretary and longtime party strategist Arthur Sinodinus. Social analyst Rebecca Huntley, who says politicians should be listening to the sensible centre. People's panellist and recent law graduate Luxley Logathusson. The Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Education, Amanda Rishworth, and the Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, John Roskam. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, tonight we're hoping to get to questions from across the country. Our first question's in the studio and it's from Peter Ring. Peter. Good evening. Um, in an obvious bid to buy votes, the government has announced it will be giving out cash payments in the budget to supposedly help with power bills. Is it too much to expect federal politicians to do what is best for the country rather than simply secure votes? Arthur Sinodinas. Well, I think the thing to say about the, uh, the energy assistance payments is that they're a down payment on the fact that the government is taking action to try and reduce energy prices and make them more affordable. Because there's no doubt over the last decade energy prices have been going up for a whole variety of reasons, going back to when state governments were gold plating their electricity systems. So I think you should see those payments in that sort of uh, context, Peter, wherever you are. I can't quite see you now. Uh, there. He's up to the right. Oh, OK, up there. Um, I think you should see them in that context. They're a down payment on measures the government's taking to make it easier for people to afford their electricity bills. And there are other measures coming in terms of a default market offer so that all the firms, the big energy companies, have to offer uh, an appropriate standard reference price that's discounted that people can then compare across providers because that's also been another issue, uh, as well as taking other action to try and reduce the cost of electricity and make it more affordable. Arthur, is it fair to say that if you'd kept the national energy guarantee and perhaps the Prime Minister who came along with it, um, you wouldn't have had to do this because uh, Josh Frydenberg, actually, when he was the author of the NEG, uh, said it was going to save consumers $550 a year. And, of course, these cash payouts are much lower than that. Well, there, there's, there's more to the measures we're now taking than just the cash payouts. But, but, but the question but, was, but would, the would, needed, would you have yeah, needed no, no, to I'm, do it? I'm if you, coming, yeah, okay, I'm coming you. to that. And the, the fact is the national energy guarantee is no longer on the table. It was taken off the table. There was, as you say, a change of leader. Even before that, Malcolm Turnbull had taken it off the table. We have to work with what we've got. Sadly. Is that well, what you're saying? Well, we have to work with what we've got and uh, we've moved on. The National Energy Guarantee had its advantages, uh, but the fact of the matter is it's no longer there and we've moved on to a different policy. OK. Amanda Rishworth. Well, look, um, after six years, uh, I think the only way to describe this payment is too little, too late. Um, this government's had six years to act on energy prices, whether that's attract more supply into the system. I mean, 13 failed energy uh, policies is one of, of real failure over six years. And I think um, what we're seeing now is the government desperately trying to uh, claw back some votes um, uh, on an even of, a, of an election. But it doesn't make up for six years of energy failure, whether that is about bringing retailers into line, whether that's attracting more renewable energy into the system. We've had a government that has been absolute chaos when it comes to energy policy, and that's what we're dealing with at the moment. OK. Now, later Labor is committed, is it not, to keeping these cash payments if you win government? Well, they're one-off cash payments and they will be delivered on the 1st of July. So uh, we have said that anything that supports um, low and middle-income earners as well as pensioners, carers, uh, we're not going to stand in the way. So, but obviously, if you're going to do it, it must be a good idea. Well... It is too little too late. I mean, what this doesn't make up for is real action on energy prices. And that has been about a real national energy uh, program, a real uh, design, a national energy uh, design that actually delivers lower prices. We know what that is. That's investment in renewable energy. That's government leadership. We're willing to still talk about the NEG, Arthur. Like, we are real, still willing to discuss that, put that on the table, because we want real action that will actually lead to lower prices in the long term, not a one-off hit. John Roskam. Oh, I think this is bad policy. You don't do anything about the rising price of electricity, which over the last decade has roughly doubled in price. 
by giving people cash handouts to pay for higher electricity prices. Uh, from the IPA's perspective, our argument is that staying in the Paris Protocol costs the Australian economy $50 billion a year. If renewables are going to push down the price of electricity, why, as renewables increase, is electricity getting more expensive? The idea that we are taxing people and then giving them their money back, I think, is... So why do you policy. think, uh, John, the government is paying out cash handouts oh, uh, Tony, to a certain th section of the... Tony, I think that's a really important question because cost of living pressures are going to be central to this campaign. So if you look at electricity prices, they've increased roughly four times the, uh, the CPI rate. So both Labor and Liberal parties are going to have to be doing similar sorts of things. Rebecca? Um, I think the electorate is very cynical about one-off cash payments, no matter who gives them when, and particularly close to an election. Um, so I think that they then ask, is something not being done that's more long-term, that's more structural? And to tell you the truth, um, energy policy and environment policy broadly has flummoxed both sides of politics. And voters see, well, there has been absolute um, problems in this area. And the fact that we haven't got our act together 10 years ago, if not more, is probably one of the reasons why we're going to see more electricity prices get higher and higher in the future. Um, I'm not an economist, John, but I can tell you what the electorate feel. They feel if that we got renewables right it would actually make energy cheaper, perhaps not now, but in the future. And so there's a real frustration about that as well. Lakshmi, um, you're our people's panellist. What do you feel about cash payouts? Um, I, don't, I doubt whether you'd be getting them, but certain sections of the community will. Yes, thankfully my parents are paying for my electricity bill um, because I do still live at home. Um, but I think, like the panel are saying, I think the electorate does see through this. This is effectively... $75 in one hand that's going to go straight to the electricity companies on the other hand, and then next month you're just left to pay it like you do every other month. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't really feel like a solution. It feels almost like a Band-Aid fix, but one of those really bad, cheap Band-Aids that kind of just falls off after <laughs> two seconds of wearing it. You live in Western Sydney and, of course, a lot of policy focus is on people who live in Western Sydney and similar suburbs in other cities around the country. What do you think generally people will be thinking about this? Do you think they'll be cynical about it? I think they'll be um, happy to get some kind of relief, but I don't know that they'll be thinking about it for too, lo too long. Like I said, it's more of a kind of a transactionary act and then next month they've moved on to the next bill and the problem still exists, like John said. OK, our next question comes via the web. It's from Felicity Martin in Queensland. I'll read it out. Uh, the one-off cash payment goes to pensioners, single parents and the disabled, but not those on Newstart. Is this like petrol when Joe Hockey said people on Newstart don't drive cars? Maybe people on Newstart don't use electricity. Does the panel think this is fair? Arthur. Um, in, in the, the, this payment was structured to go to people who are on um, a, a series of particular payments, pension payments and welfare beneficiaries. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened in relation to New Start. Well, I, they're not getting it. Yeah, but, yeah, but what I'm saying is I'm not sure exactly what the rationale there will be. It'd be um, good to come up with one, I think, the, because um, a lot of people out there are wondering why the government left these people out. The, but I can, I can tell you this, um, and this is where I agree with John Howard, I think rather than just either say we're going to put people in the workforce, they've got to find a job, or uh, as Labor is saying, we'll review the perhaps the thing at some stage, I think we have reached a stage where we have to look more fundamentally at what we do about New Start because it's been allowed to uh, decrease relative to wages for so long now. You know what, we're actually going to come to that specific question, but just on the logic of this, yeah. uh, if people on Newstart, as our, our questioner asked, and we actually we edited that bit out, but she said people on Newstart get less than the people on all of those other payments and they still use electricity and they're not going to get this payout. Do you know why? Well, the short answer is I don't know why. Mm. Amanda Rishworth. Well, look, obviously we haven't seen the details of this policy and we won't see all the details um, of the budget until budget night. Um, but when it comes to New Start, Labor's been very clear. We think it is too low. We do think the level of New Start is too low. And we want to go through a proper, thorough process to look at what uh, the rate should be, uh, how it interacts with other payments and uh, other pensions. But this uh, one-off uh, 
uh, payment is going to be long gone uh, before we get a chance, if we are elected to government, to have a good, thorough look at New Well, Zealand. you're going to get a chance, if you win government, to put that payment through. So the question for Labor is, are you going to include New Start? people uh, in that payment? Well, I guess it depends when it goes through the parliament, um, but it'll be in the budget. We will be reviewing uh, those measures that haven't gone through. As we've said, we haven't seen the details yet. We've said we won't stand in the way of the current payments, but what we are saying is this is not a long-term fix when it comes to energy or cost of living either. So, uh, But we're really serious about raising the level of New Start. Um, but you're not going to make any commitments about including the New Start people on the cash payment, which some people will get and they won't. Well, we've got to see the details of the budget and when it goes through the parliament. John Roscoe. I think that highlights exactly what the problem is with these sorts of payments. If you're going to make them, then they should go to recipients of the New Start allowance. Uh, there's many other categories of, of people who might be missing out as well. We know that, by and large, pensioners pay more uh, for electricity often than, uh, than younger families. We've got to be focused on reducing the price of energy, not these one-off payments that both parties like. Rebecca. It's a very rare thing. I agree with John. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're going to have a one-off payment, and I'm sceptical about them, is that it should go for pe to people on New Start. Mm. And in fact, people on New Start and the unemployed generally keep getting left out of of these kinds of things when the government does it. Um, when there were the stimulus payments under um, Prime Minister Rudd, unemployed, unemployed people missed out on that as well. It's as if they don't kind of live in our society. And I do worry about it because I think as, as the community recognise that the gap between rich and poor is growing, are we becoming... Have, are we having less sympathy, less empathy for people who are unemployed and stuck in, in let's say, the gig economy with no ability to move forward. So this is what... It seems like we're punishing the people at the absolute end of the economic spectrum. OK, let's move on. The next question comes via Skype. It's from George Maxwell in Brunswick, Victoria. Go ahead, George. This week, protesters will gather to mark 25 years since the rate of New Start was last raised. During that time, costs of living have soared, forcing many job seekers into poverty. The only actions from major parties have, to, have been to announce reviews into raising the rate. In the land of the fair go, how is this 25-year inaction acceptable? Arthur, that goes back to what you were saying earlier, yeah, so I'll yeah. start with you. Um, yes, but to add to what I said earlier, um, what we found after a long period of economic growth, uh, a sustained period of growth, is that welfare dependency has actually gone down because people are getting more jobs. And this suggests that that includes people on New Start. The main area where I have a concern is those who seem to be caught in this cycle of long-term unemployment. Uh, there have been some reforms to our job active system or the job service providers recently, which I think try and address that. But my concern has been, from, and I've been on a number of Senate committees now and I've seen this, the, there's a group in the community of long-term unemployed who are caught in a cycle of dependency, whether it's because of substance abuse. You know, it's often chicken and egg in these situations, not sure which leads to which, um, that require particularly intensive assistance, and they're the ones that we're trying to do more for. Um, and the point of raising them is that I, I don't think we should just look at the unemployed as a whole. There are some unemployed who are fit and ready to go, and yet there are others who are caught in these cycles of dependency. Mm. But for the, people, for the people who are stuck on New Start or even yes. on it for a temporary period, yes. uh, should it be higher? That's really what the question is saying. Hasn't, hasn't been raised properly for a very long time. We're saying that we want to encourage people to get more jobs, but if I look at this, if I were in the uh, shoes of someone who's unemployed trying to get a job, I would clearly want a higher level of New Start while I'm looking for a job. Mm. Uh, because we've also taken a number of measures to encourage people to find jobs, in, you know, in terms of the compliance measures I'm talking about. So, so, so New Start should be higher, in your opinion? I, I think over time it should be higher. Now, of course, uh, that's probably uh, a slightly radical thing for me to say here, and I'm putting a personal view, I'm not necessarily talking on behalf of the government here, but my observation is that this does raise a, a, an issue that should be considered at some stage. There is a cost to the budget, there's an expense, but then again, budgets are all about choices and over time we have to think about that choice in the context of our other choices. Amanda Richworth. 
Well, firstly, I'd say that... Um, I'm, uh, you'd be reaching across the table and embracing well, well, uh, uh, Arthur for... I'm really for pleased because the rest of the government has been spending their time demonising people on New Start, and while they're there, they've been demonising people on disability support pensions as well. Um, we've had to reject numerous pieces of legislation, in, including um, dr uh, random drug testing and then cutting off payments. In fact, under Tony Abbott, after six months, the government wanted to cancel New Start altogether. So uh, I think the attitude towards people on New Start and other pension payments has been uh, pretty, pretty awful from this government and has been pretty negative and talking people down. We know that people need that support and uh, I, people might um, be cynical about a review, but the review worked with the age pension. Uh, we did, when we came into government last time, a pretty significant review of the age pension. We worked out what the base rate needed to be lifted. We made room in the budget and got that base rate lifted in the pension to get pensioners out of poverty. That is the similar pathway that we are suggesting going forward to look at how it interacts to do it uh, with some academic behind it and actually work on where we should go forward. So I actually think that that process is a sound process uh, and one that should be done from government if we're elected. So no guarantees, no policy guarantee, just a review? Well, we have said that we think New Start is too low and we have said we want to go through this process. Okay. That, that's the responsible thing that a party of government should do. John Roskin. I think we could have a unity ticket on this. I, I would raise the new start allowance. Mm. It's about $6.50 an hour. The minimum wage is about $18 an hour. It's very hard to live on the new start allowance, but we have to recognise a few things. If we are to do that, we should make it easier for employers to employ people. We've got around 700,000 unemployed people. They all should have the dignity of work. Our industrial relations system, I think, now works against employers taking a risk sometimes, employing someone who might have had a troubled or difficult past. What concerns me is we're just talking about raising welfare payments, and they are low, absolutely, mm. but we have to focus on getting people... But are you saying, are you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying it should be raised so that people have this dignity to live, to go out and buy new clothes, new absolutely, shoes, the sort Tony. of things you need to present yourself when you're absolutely. going for a job? Absolutely, and to have the dignity of work, because the best form of welfare is a job. Lakshmi. I think that there is no one person that can be described as being the typical person on, on Newstart or some kind of welfare benefit. Um, and I think in our community maybe we do give them a bit of a bad rap. Um, all of these people don't... None of them want to be on Newstart. None of them want to be getting support from the government. Um, the actual the pain and the shame that comes with going and applying for this kind of benefit is actually quite deep and it's not as easy as just going ahead and just receiving a payment. So I think absolutely Newstart needs to be increased. People are doing it tough and we need to uplift them in order to ensure that they can give it a good go um, in our community. Rebecca, what does the Sensible Centre think <laughs> about this, do you suppose? Well, we are hearing all the opinions of the Sensible Centre. We're all agreeing. Where's no. Tina McQueen when you <laughs> need her? <laughs> She's uh, welcome back any time. Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, look, I totally agree with the points that have been made, but kind of thinking about um, some of the language we use, so even thinking about things like welfare dependency as if it's some kind of a drug that we can't break, and that's not to say that there aren't um, households in Australia where there's generations of people who are unemployed. But really, generally, where what the government gives pays to people who are struggling to find work for various reasons is some support to live in order to continue to be or to be kind of do things, kind of luxuries like eat and sleep under a roof and things like that. So I think that ca calling it welfare dependency is really problematic for me. But in the work that I do, the thing that I worry most about is not people who are not employed, it's people who are overworked. I mean, in the last two years, there's a 20% increase in people having a second job. Um, there are people working extremely hard, um, well-educated people, people who haven't been able to get past um, Year 10, and the rewards for hard work in our society are not what they once were. And so I'm also worried about that. 
kind of more broadly. Rebecca, we're going to talk a little more about jobs yeah. and the future of jobs in a moment. Now, you're watching Q&A the night before the budget. The next question comes from Brandon Cobra-Brown. Thank you, Tony. Um, it has been 15 years since Australia saw its last surplus. Uh, in that time, uh, the federal government has racked up $691 billion in debt. The Treasurer is expected to hand down the first surplus tomorrow since the Howard government. With that in mind, when, if ever, will the federal government's debt be paid or is it going to be left to my generation to clean up? Arthur, I'll start with you again on that one. And um, obviously uh, you're going to get a surplus tomorrow, but most of it will be spent. Uh, well, we'll see tomorrow night. Uh, but, but a couple of points. So you don't First think that's is, true? Do you think there'll be uh, a big surplus? It's all speculation, well, we know. It's, it's all speculation. That's, that's you probably point. know the answer. I have no inside information. <laughs> but let me make a couple of points. The first is we, we pursue surpluses not as an end in themselves uh, because over the economic cycle as we accumulate debt, that can reduce our flexibility when there's a downturn, for example, to be able to run the budget down as we did with the, great, uh, with the global financial crisis in order to give support to the economy. So it's important over time to try and smooth out, if you like, uh, the, the budget. In terms of levels of debt that are sustainable, um, it varies for different countries, but for a country like Australia, a relatively small open economy which can be subject to adverse external shocks, it's better to carry a smaller debt load rather than a, a bigger debt load. Um, now, that said, there's been a capacity in Australia for us to fund uh, infrastructure and uh, major other capital developments. The NBN's been done off budget, for example. Uh, so we have a capacity, I think, to be funding things through debt, but we are also now, because of the surplus, going to be in a position where we start to stabilise our debt position, reduce our interest payments, and as we reduce our net interest payments, that means we've got more capacity to spend on other things. It just makes you stronger and better able to spend on essential services. So it's important to have that discipline in the system. Let me just go back to... Brandon's put his hand up, so um, you obviously want to respond to that. Yeah. I mean... Thank as, a, as a representative of the future generations, which you think will have to pay back all this money. That's right. Well, thank you for defining what a budget is in general. Um, but my question was, when's the money going to be paid to foreign lenders? Well, in terms of the... We'll see tomorrow night in terms of the projection for the next... There'll probably be projections for the next 10 years in terms of a series of surpluses, and that will have an impact in terms of reducing debt as debt is paid off over time. Um, we're already covering our recurrent expenses, our operating expenses as a government, and we're using debt to pay for investment. So uh, over the next decade, we'll be putting things in the opposite direction. We'll be starting to pay debt off. Um, but also what will happen as surpluses occur is we'll increase our financial assets. Our net debt will start to go down. So it's not a case of then having zero absolute debt. What it will be is debt in net terms will be lower. And so the debt burden on your generation will start to go down. But your generation will also have the benefit of the infrastructure investment that we're going to be putting in place over the next few years. There's about $75 billion worth of infrastructure investment in the pipeline. That's a pre pretty big investment in the future. Uh, Rebecca, do you get the sense of people um, worried about the extent of our national and state debt? When you combine the two, they're pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, it probably isn't as much of a concern as you might imagine it, it would be. So if you kind of list all the things that people worry about, it's, it, it sometimes creeps into the top ten. It may be because people don't understand the whole issue of debt. It also might be because a lot of us are living with debt, so we just maybe think it's a big national credit card that we have to we maybe keep putting money People got in. to understand it in Australia during the Great Depression because the country was terribly in debt at that point and it took us a long time to get out of it. Yeah, and there is a bit of a generational um, issue around debt. I suppose the larger question people ask is if we're going to pursue the idea of a surplus by um, kind of cutting services to people... Um, then is the burden being borne kind of equally? So are, are ordinary taxpayers or the bulk of the, of the population who might be having to give up things in order to have a surplus, um, are the really are the big end of town, um, you know, paying their fair share? So I think often that discussion about debt moves into a discussion about how fair our tax system is. OK, we won't have that discussion quite <laughs> at the moment. It'll just take too long. John Roskam... Um, 
do you share the concerns of uh, the questioner? Oh, I do. I think your grandchildren are going to be paying off the debt. If tomorrow night we have a budget surplus of three or four billion dollars on current rates, it's going to take 140 years to pay off the debt. We were talking about welfare payments before. We're paying $18 billion a year in interest payments. That's the sixth largest item in the budget. That's more than we spend on income support for those with disabilities. And exactly as Arthur said, we are a small open trading economy. Our 28 years of economic growth have been predicated on resources and population growth. If the resources boom doesn't continue, if interest rates go up, we are going to be in a very difficult situation. And right at the moment, exactly as Rebecca said, I'm not sure that this is front of mind of, of the population. And Bill Shorten says we're going to have a debate uh, in this election about the living wage and so on, as we should. I think we should have a debate about debt. Mm. Uh, Amanda, do you agree? Well, look, we have been quite critical of the government, particularly as the surplus uh, that, that will be predicted tomorrow night when we say the budget is as a result of a commodity mm. uh, increase. So commodities have gone up, nothing to do with government management, just an increase in what the world is paying for our uh, uh, commodities. That's not a structural change to the budget. And that's why Labor has been quite upfront about some big structural changes we would like to make. Uh, not popular with everyone, uh, but things that we think are responsible in setting the budget on a long-term footing. That means that we can both pay for our mm. investment... You're talking about increasing the tax burden on a range of people you would regard as being wealthier than others. Uh, what, what we're suggesting is to <laughs> tackle negative gearing, which is not uh, increasing tax. It's currently a tax concession and we're winding that tax concession back. Uh, we're looking at other measures including family trusts and uh, capital gains tax measures that are about actually putting structural change within the budget so that we can build up bigger surpluses over time and pay down our debt for the reasons, as Arthur did mention, is that we need to weather uh, potential difficult economic times in the future. But we've been quite critical of the government because not only have they doubled uh, the net debt uh, of this country, but in addition, they've made no structural reform whatsoever and cut our hospitals and schools at the same time. Pretty amazing, really. Um, but um, that's been our uh, plan and we've been very clear about it. We've been upfront with the Australian people um, and we've got, we, we see the structural issues in the budget going forward as a priority. Lakshmi, uh, you obviously represent the younger uh, demographic who presumably have to pay for uh, these billions of dollars of debt. Um, are you worried about it at all? I think what I'm worried about is that the government is really celebrating the fact that we're in a surplus. I mean, I think the Australian people don't really feel like they're in a surplus, um, but the government is telling us that, hey, we're actually, yeah, we're doing well. Um, and I think what people really want to know is what is the real state of our economy, and I think they'd actually appreciate knowing that actually we might be running a surplus, but we've got all this debt, and this is what my, our generation will have to deal with. Uh, let's move to something which is, um, well, let's say it's more current. It happened last week and uh, Bob Vinicom has a question. <clears throat> uh, yes, the uh, recent Al Jazeera stitch-up job in One Nation raises some serious issues. Do you think it is ethical for the ABC to be recording private conversations of politicians without their knowledge? And if so, would you like the ABC to do it to you? Uh, I'll start with John Roskam, who's a noted critic of the ABC. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yes, Tony. Mm. Um, Would you like to see us privatise? Yes. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I, I think this is an issue of, of public interest. Uh, if you have politicians or politicians' uh, assistants seeking the support of, of the public, uh, seeking uh, to influence public policy, then I must admit, as difficult as some of the ethical issues were raised, um, I don't think it is inappropriate. Uh, what concerned me is a, a former Queensland minister uh, talking about his role in regulating things, his role in uh, determining the lives of the rest of us. So, for me, there's the question of guns and, and, and that process, but it's also the attitude of those two people to regulation and to uh, how they, they were to govern the country and, and gain seats. So, look, I think it was 
in the public interest, although I think there are questions around it. OK. Um, well, actually, let's hear from Arthur. Do you agree in the public interest and uh, therefore justified? Um, I, I wasn't particularly fussed that there'd been an inverted commas a sting because you sort of get used to these things. I mean, there have been all these exposés in, the in, in the UK, for example. I remember Prince Andrew got caught up in at least one sting. Mm. Um, so I've come to accept that this is a bit of a journalistic technique, that this happens. Now, people say, oh, but hang on, it's entrapment, and uh, they wouldn't have done this if they hadn't been enticed. But the fact of the matter is that, faced with a choice, they made certain choices. Mm. And, and what we are talking about here is the choices that were made. And those choices were to be prepared to entertain getting money from foreign sources to influence Australian elections and to seek to dilute Australia's gun laws. And, and no matter what Pauline Hanson may say now in retrospect, the fact of the matter is she has clearly raised questions about what happened at Port Arthur. She has clearly raised questions through her people, Dixon and, and Ashby, about uh, getting money from outside sources. So uh, in a sense it was a revelation of a state of mind and what it might lead to. And certainly it was a turning point for the Prime Minister, I think, because that... Because, uh, you know, all of a sudden, John Howard's gun laws were up for auction. Mm. And there's no way... The let me, let me ask you this. If it genuinely that. was a turning point for the Prime Minister, yeah. do you expect him now to put One Nation last on every ticket? Well, what he said he's going to do is put it uh, after uh, Labor. But so... not the Greens. Well, look... But not the Greens. As if the Greens are an equivalent to this kind of um, behaviour of One Nation. Well, I'm interested in that. Well, Why no, no. We, well, we attack... All sorts of parties. We attack the Greens, we attack One Nation. You attack yourself. Uh, Sometimes you're attacking um, yourself. <laughs> Pretty often. Uh, we're in a coalition that attacks other groups because we want to get votes off those other groups. So we'll criticise, as appropriate, the policies of the Greens. So is it appropriate, is it appropriate for you to for have... The, Arthur, the policies of One Nation? Arthur, given what you've said about One Nation, yeah. is it appropriate to have any kind of sharing arrangement with them when it comes to preferences? Because... The, the, the scary thing is for many people um, that many One Nation people who think like that could actually take advantage of this situation. Well, I, last we, on the we, we make a distinction between the One Nation party itself and people who vote for it. Mm. Uh, just as we make a distinction between the, the people, Greens the people political who's, party and people who may vote for the it. The people who may get preferences are not the people who vote. They're the people who'd end up in Parliament. But... What we have said and said clearly is we will preference Labor before them. And that's where the Prime Minister is now. So and if, you're, if your preference arrangements country. lead to any One Nation people, any extra One Nation people getting into Parliament um, in the Senate... Or yeah, but taking this logical conclusion, you've got the situation where Labor would have to say that they refuse to have any of their members elected on One Nation preferences across the country. Mm -hmm. And yet, manifestly, that's happened in elections. I suppose for me, I think, what does it take to, to make every political party say, we are going to put these people last as a principle? Not only their racism, but their ability to sell out our national interest, our national protection, to the highest bidder offshore. It's just shocking. So to your point, sir, yeah, there are, you know, some ethical issues around what was done, I suppose. But, I mean, to call it entrapment, he didn't kidnap them, put them on a plane and suddenly present them to the NRA. He said, let's go over, and they went over. You know, they were willing. They <laughs> threw themselves in the hole. OK, our question has got his hand up. Bob Vinnikin. <clears throat> um, why, do, why do Liberal and Labor take massive donations from the gambling industry, which is, a, which is the major cause of poverty in Australia? That's a really, really good point. If I think this, what has happened with One Nation is probably not going to do much to the people who really vote One Nation but it could do something to all the political parties, in particular Labor and Liberal, to look at our donation regime at the Commonwealth level. It is shocking. Um, we, we've, we've actually got a question coming oh, okay. up about I'll that. I keep so, preempting but I just want to hear... I'll just go to the other side of the <laughs> panel and we'll start with John because um, his view may be different than Amanda. Oh, look, look it would be different. Um, notwithstanding my many great differences with One Nation, from my perspective... The Greens pose a challenge to the Australian way of life in a way One Nation doesn't. I think the Greens have a deep strain of anti-Semitism. Um, I think their, their policies are going to 
uh, de-industrialise the country. Mm. Uh, their p policy to ban the export of thermal coal, for example, could put 150,000 people out of work. Their recent policy to say there'll be no new petrol cars from 2030, I think, will devastate regional Australia. And you have to remember uh, that it's up to us where we put our preferences. The Labor Party or the Liberal Party can, can decide. It's up, uh, it's up to us. One Nation is no friend of the Coalition. It was One Nation preferences that cost the Coalition seats in, uh, in 2016. But from my perspective, I'd put the Greens last. OK, Amanda. Well, firstly, I would point out that the Prime Minister has not been definitive. He has tried to have a bob each way. He said Liberals will preference Labor uh, at One Nation after Labor, but LNP members, National Party members, that's still up to them. So if he was truly a conviction politician on this issue, he would demand every member of the government, every person that could potentially be part of a coalition government, to put One Nation last. So you're that... saying that, that that will particularly impact in Queensland, what you're talking about. Uh, are you calling on the Prime Minister to shift that position? Uh, I am calling on the Prime Minister to put One Nation last everywhere Probably in this won't listen to you. Probably <laughs> won't listen. <laughs> but it shows that he is not actually... It took him so long to get to this position. It took people calling for weeks for him to get to this position. Uh, he didn't do it decisively and now he's sort of do doing it because of public pressure. And in Queensland and other places, uh, there are still many members of the government that are saying, no, we're going to put one Labor behind, uh, Labor behind one nation. So that's the first point. In terms of the Greens, look, there's many policies that I think uh, the Liberal Party are going to destroy the country with. There's many uh, policies I think the Greens will de destroy the country with. That is very, very different from having a party that's moved a well-known white supremacist slogan motion in the Parliament of Australia. We need as a collective group of people to say, yeah, we might disagree on policies from time to time. In fact, I might think uh, that many of the Greens' policies are delusional and the LNP, uh, but that's not dangerous. What we're seeing and what we saw in Christchurch is that hate speech can lead to violence. We need to stand up together. We need to reject this, and that's why it's incumbent on the Prime Minister to put One Nation last right around this country. Lakshmi. Look, um, unsurprisingly, I've never voted for the One Nation Party, <laughs> um, and I don't know what it would what it, what how, what would propel someone to vote for One Nation. But I think to dismiss that voter and to dismiss their concerns and to not take them seriously is a big mistake. Um, One Nation have built their brand on being, you know, the voice for the the battler, the worker, the the people of the. Uh, you know, different to the major parties. They're straight speaking, they're honest, they're, they're true blue, and that is their brand, and that's what's connected with voters. Um, I think the videos that came out, if I was someone who was voting for One Nation and I saw those videos, then I would seriously question what I was being sold and what I was being presented and what I was voting for. Our gun laws are not only a beacon of good governance and leadership domestically, they're, a, they're an example to the world. And they protect the safety of Australians. It goes to the heart of what a government does. And for One Nation to turn around and to sell the watering down of that policy, if I was voting for One Nation, I'd seriously question what I was voting for, because that is selling off a, the safety of Australians. And that's not something we should stand for. Thank you very much. Now, the next question comes via Skype. It's from uh, Jacqueline Snyder in Brisbane. Recent media coverage has revealed the length some political parties will go to to source funding, even travelling to the United States seeking large donations from cashed-up pro-gun organisations. And I've seen research that shows big donors get privileged access to our politicians once they're elected. So what can we do about this takeover of our democratic processes that means money talks while normal individual voters are shut out? Is it time to drastically restrict political donations altogether? Rebecca, um, I told you we'd get to that oh, question. Yeah, thank and you. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> off you go. 
Yeah, so um, I was a bit surprised just about how much what they call dark money circulates in any financial year um, in the system. So 2016, about $77 million that can't be traced back to anything circulating as political donations. So to the, um, to the point that Jacqueline said, you know, this idea that, that big corporations buy access from politicians, we can't say that definitively because we don't know what's happening with that money. There'd be some very, very straightforward reforms that you could bring in at the federal level. The state level has, has bring in, brought in quite a number of reforms. One of them could be making sure that disclosure limits weren't at $13,000. One would also be um, making sure that we could have real-time disclosure. So we find out when somebody gives money, we don't find out six, seven, eight, nine, ten months um, down the track. I often say if you have a, a telethon with Grant Denyer, you know who's given the money on at time. I think you should be able to do it. I think, I think we should hire Grant Denyer to tell us who, <laughs> what big corporations are giving money. So I don't necessarily think there's a lot of brown paper bags um, circulating in the system, but I think there's absolutely a perception from the public level that um, uh, there is privileged access, at least, or um, bought with donations from, you know, big corporations and wealthy individuals. Arthur, do you think that's true? Um, I, th I think a couple of things. The first is more caps on the cost of campaigning. To reduce the cost of campaigning, I think, would be good. Um, in New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell in 2011 tried to restrict donations to people who were on the electoral roll, but unions in New South Wales drove a truck through that in the High Court on the basis that that was restricting uh, political communication or freedom of communication. Uh, and so ever since then, of course, there's been this question of how to deal with third parties, whether it's the unions or uh, groups in the community or GetUp or others, uh, and the firepower that they can potentially bring to the table. On this question of access, um, I don't think it works quite in the way that some people think, in that um, I believe, for example, that companies may donate to a political party because they like their policies, but it's not because the party has developed a policy to cater for that particular company or that particular industry. So if you're seen as pro-business, it's likely there'll be businesses who support you because they think, well, this is a party which will provide a better environment for business. But Arthur, for isn't there a reinforcing circle here? OK, so you're a mining giant. You give yeah. money to the National Party because you like their policy and you keep giving money. What's the likelihood, if you're a National Party leader of the National Party, that you're going to change your policy on, let's say, climate change because that will mean the money stops? Well, in the Howard government, <coughs> we developed an emissions trading scheme. We lost the election. It never got implemented. That's my answer to that. All right, so no influence <laughs> at all from uh, big look, resources look, companies, is that what you're saying, Arthur? The, because the, that's the, a little hard no, to No, no, no. Uh, well, there are big resource companies like BHP who are running a very different line on climate change. That's true, that's true. Yep. To uh, what the parts of the government have been running. Yep, but, but what I'm trying to say is it doesn't... Ma in some ways, the reality doesn't matter because we can't see where the money's coming from and where it's going. Okay. Well, I can well, tell well, you that do, the public... But, but I... The point I've made, and I'm on the record on this in a number of contexts over the last three or four years, I think real-time disclosure yep. is something I am quite keen on because I think yep. that does allow you to see things more oh, quickly okay. and it provides more right. information and transparency. Okay, I'm gonna, the I'm only gonna... other point I'll make is we have clamped down on foreign think, donations right. and we have a yeah. foreign transparency scheme. I think the lady wants to ask yeah. you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think that yes. might be true, but um, I can't see her and I um, just... Yeah, I, okay, I'd, I'd like to know a good reason as to why we can't have real-time reporting at the very least. Can okay, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> reply? Yep, thank you very much. Uh, Amanda? So, look, I absolutely think that uh, as a voter you should be able to go in to the ballot box knowing who supported each candidate and that involves real-time disclosure and reducing uh, the disclosure limits to $1,000. There's a lot of people that do want to contribute $20, $30 to campaigns but in terms of those big amounts of money, people should know where that's coming from and they should know at the time they go into the ballot box so they can make an informed decision. But I would might like 
to make a comment about influence. As a member of the lower house, I spend my time going out speaking with people at street corner meetings. They don't have to pay to come and see me at the shopping centre at street corner meetings. There's many, many ways that you can get in touch with your local representative. And I tell you what motivates me. When I find out that uh, children at schools in my electorate may never have actually seen a book before they get to school, that has more influence on me uh, than donations and a whole range of things. That, and don't underestimate being able to get in touch with your local member and putting pressure on them, whether that's through Facebook, email, rocking up at their office, seeing them at a shopping centre, seeing them on street quarter meetings. There's many ways you do not have to buy uh, to get into the ear of your local representative. OK, I've got to move on because we've got plenty of questions we want to get to. This one's from Jordan Dibya. <coughs> Good evening. Um, as a migrant of African descent, I live in a world of constant social judgment and direct racism to the uh, due to the impact of the media's portrayal of Sudanese youth-related crime in Melbourne. African communities are often portrayed as violent and gang-related. How can we combat this issue, uh, this stereotype, that has nothing to do with my community or even the city I live in? Lakshmi, is that with you? There's a saying in Tamil that goes... And that means that if you have a wound caused by a fire, that will heal in time. But words, le words leave scars. And I think as someone growing in Western Sydney, I have been in a multiracial society. I've grown up with all different kinds of people and I don't feel as though I've really experienced racism in all its forms. But lots of people in our community do. And the, the truth of the matter is that words have impacts, words have effects. We've seen that in Christchurch. Words don't just go nowhere. Hate speech perpetuates and it has consequences. And I think it's so important as a society for us to be cognizant of those kind of impacts of the words that we are putting out there. John Roskam. I think the way to overcome those stereotypes is to tell the very best stories of, of communities. I'm not sure... Um, what about the idea of actually stopping racist speech, John? Because I know you're a, no, you're a huge advocate of free I am. speech. I am. I think that's a very problematic uh, attempt. Uh, speech that incites violence uh, should be prohibited. Um, but what, what alarmed... about racist speech? Well, what is the well, violence is is deeper. Well, again, but what is racist speech? Is is speech that is offensive, uh, based on race? Should that be unlawful? I don't think so. I think in a free society, to to use the language of Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, uh, offensive speech and insulting speech is the price we pay for living in a free society. And what concerned me after the tragedy of Christchurch is that now we're having discussion about potential blasphemy laws, about government regulation of the internet. The way to overcome exactly the stereotypes you are talking about is to have a discussion about it and to have it in public and not to push it underground and not to demonise people who think differently. And I think... Can I just, go, just quickly go back to our question, Jordan, if you, yeah. you don't have to respond, but uh, what do you think about that argument? Um, See, for me, it's more based on the generalisation that's been uh, portrayed by the media of where it's just the Sudanese minorities and the youth that are actually doing some of these crimes. And then when the media put it out, like Channel 7 and Channel 9, they generalise in terms of Africans. I mean, I come from Uganda, not Sudan. Um, I've never committed a crime. I've never committed such heinous crimes. Um, I've never partaken in them. But then that same effect, that same um, effect from the Su what the Sudanese youth do still impacts me. Oh, and I, I completely hear that, but I'd argue the alternative is worse. The alternative of government regulation of that discussion is going to be something that, as I said, is going to drive discussion underground. And Let me just ask Lakshmi what she thinks about that. Absolutely not. Um, <coughs> these words impact people. We have seen that in all shapes and forms. And to say that racist words and racist language cannot be regulated by government, cannot be monitored by society, I think is just to shrug your shoulders and move away from the issue because you don't have to deal with it. 
people in our society do, and they're telling you, they're telling our leaders that this is an issue that needs to be addressed because it has consequences. To, sh to shrug your shoulders and walk aside is, I think, taking the easy route. Yep. John, just on that point, do you accept the general principle that the, uh, the killer in Christchurch, the murderer, started with racist speech and ended up with violence and death, murder? Y yes, but not all racist speech leads to violence. But if, so, but, but if someone had regulated the sites where he got his ideas, where he developed his ideas, where he became more and more extreme, would that oh, not yeah. have been, would you not have accepted that as a, a, a principle well, that you should do? Yes, and that's able to be already done. But what concerns me is when we use terms like racist speech or hate speech without looking at their consequences, what we are doing is denying the freedom that we have to express an opinion and a view, even if it is sometimes difficult. Amanda Rishworth. Well, look, I don't think um, we, in a modern society, get to say what we want to say any old time and do what we want to do any old time. There's always limits on that and there's limits to actually having a cohesive society and that is now outlined in the Racial Discrimination Act and, and that is uh, law. There's been a lot of attempts to change it but I don't think that's right and we've stood up for that because exactly as Lashmir said, uh, language matters and it hurts people and it divides communities and it causes a lot of social unrest that we see. And what we've seen on the internet uh, is the ability to say what you actually are not able to say in a public square and uh, grab a megaphone and be off to say that. So I do think we need to look at our social media. But there's also a moral responsibility on leaders, on media outlets. So do you agree with the Prime Minister that social media should be regulated? Uh, because he's, he's talking about uh, Facebook, Google, um, the sites where people enter to find these dark websites. I think we absolutely need to look at social media and how we might apply uh, some of the um, uh, restrictions that we have uh, outside. Now, there's technological challenges, but... Uh, you know, I think that considering how quickly, for example, copyright material is taken down, there is the technological capacity. How we do that, we've got to make sure we do it in a way that works. But when it comes to mainstream media as well, which is what your question went to, there is a moral responsibility, I think, and it's a responsibility of media outlets and leaders, and including politicians and other leaders, to be very careful about how they characterise particular whether it's crime or other things in our community, so not to just demonise a group of people. Arthur Sinodinos, um, bearing in mind that, you know, members of your cabinet um, mm. have made, you know, particular comments about mm. the uh, African crime problem. But, but let me fast forward to what happened as a result of White uh, Christchurch. And, I, and I've said this before, uh, I think it was a tipping point because what it did was, was to say, uh, you know, we've had all this focus on Islamic terrorism. Some people have called extreme Islamic terrorism. But then all of a sudden, you've got this guy who's gone out there in Christchurch and killed, what, 50 people? Who's been espousing all these theories on the internet and everything else. And, and all of a sudden, it just, I think, made a lot of people stand up and say, well, we'll hang on here. Um, we have got a responsibility to try and send the signal that it is not acceptable to demean someone because that dehumanise someone because that's the first step to then justifying doing bad things to someone by saying they're the other they're not us mm. and i think why wasn't that principle understood before christchurch i i it's, it seems such an obvious thing to say but you're saying there was a tipping point that led people to understand it. Uh, didn't people well, well, I, th I think it? it brought the white supremacist strand more to the surface because it wasn't talk. Something actually happened. It caused something to happen. So, you know, in the past you might have said, oh, these are extremists or, you know, they're just a loony lot over there. But all of a sudden you've got people who've been so radicalised, as we've seen happen 
with some Islamic groups or some Islamic people, it was a reminder that it's not whole groups that you should be demonising. You should be looking at individuals and what's gone wrong with individuals. But I would say that that cycle of hate speech leading to violence has <coughs> something that's happened overseas before. Did we really need to have something like Christchurch for us to learn that lesson? Well, so it did because there was... An, sorry, Rebecca, but there was an Australian killer involved. And all of a sudden, it was next door in New Zealand. Now, you know, we hear a lot of things that happen abroad and there are a lot more people in the Muslim world who get killed by terrorists than get killed even in Europe. But it happened next door in New Zealand and it was by an Australian. All of a sudden it was about us mm. and our attitudes. Before. Well, it certainly did shift the political debate. There's no yes. question about that. Do you, do you think it shifted in a good way? Yes, because I think it... seemed, it, like, think, the, it seemed like the political it, debate was going down a certain I, I path. I think it has now because it's I, th the I, think, direction. I think it's making all leaders far more conscious of the dimensions of what they say, that there's more than one dimension of what they say. So on one level we say, we've got to have the freedom to call out, oh, there's a particular group in Melbourne who are causing trouble. We've got to have the freedom to do that. But to also recognise what are the collateral damage or implications of doing that. And the collateral damage or implications are that someone like Jordan may feel that he'll be because of his race, will be mistaken for a Sudanese, a South Sudanese. Should, and should, should Peter Dutton have thought more carefully about that before he made those comments? And will he now think more carefully about it because we've gone well, over a tipping point? Well, I think the easy answer would be to say, ask Peter Dutton. Um, <laughs> but, but I think when, when Peter made those comments about what was happening in Victoria, he was focused on what he saw as a crime problem and he was calling that out. Mm. The only other point I will make very quickly is I met a guy from Black Rock Industries in the Hunter Valley who look after Indigenous people who are incarcerated and come out of jail and give them jobs. One of the people that he employed said to him, this is an Indigenous person, on weekends, I like to go around in my work gear because I find that people are more relaxed around me if they see me in my work gear. In other words, they think I'm a productive member of the community, whereas they will stereotype me if I go around in my normal gear. And that had an effect on me. And I thought to myself, well, this is the burden that someone who feels marginalised mm. on the fringes of society has to bear. Yeah, good point. Rebecca? I, I just want to go to your point when you said, what are we going to do about this? There has been a, a really quite a, a failure of our leaders, not just in politics, but in, in our community more broadly, in our business community, um, and particularly in our media in speaking about this. And like I said, while Christchurch hit home, definitely, Arthur, we don't have to have something happen right on our doorstep to learn the, to learn the lessons. We've seen what's happened in Trump's America about greater hate speech leading to violence. So we should have looked at America and we should have said it could happen here. And so it's all well and good for somebody to say the way to combat racism um, for Australians from African descent is to get your stories out. Well, let's face it, the, the, the stories that are um, racially vilifying generally are louder. Have you been um, a guest on Sunrise any time recently? Has Andrew Bolt asked you on your show? No, he doesn't. So there are lots of stories about um, that could be told. It's a question of are we providing platforms for them and are we providing leadership? I would have liked the Prime Minister before he sat and lectured a whole lot of people in the telecommunications and the social media um, space, and it's problematic to have to actually do that, to look at his own party and to stand up and have some of those conversations with his own party before he lectured other people. OK, uh, Jordan, thanks for your question, which inspired a very interesting debate, I must say. Thank you very much. We've got time for one last question. It's a video from Oscar Cook Abbott in Frankston, Victoria. To Arthur Sinodinus, congratulations on beating cancer. Has your experience changed your outlook on life or politics? Arthur. Uh, well, and thanks welcome, very much. Welcome back, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I am on the other side of this now. I, I'm now a survivor. There are no guarantees. I had a bone marrow transplant in April of last year. That's my best bet against a recurrence. So I live every day with the anxiety, oh, suddenly will some symptom appear uh, and, and am I going to go through the same journey again? But if I do, I, I'm ready for it because the thing that this whole experience has taught me is try and find something out of every day, actually live in the day, 
uh, prioritise things. I've, throughout my life, I've worked pretty hard and I've tended to say, I've got more time, I'll put things off, I'll do this some other time. No, there may not be more time. So if there's something you want to do, get on and do it. The other thing is I've become far more, I think, involved in the lives of other people. More compassionate? Um, in the sense that uh, when I come across someone who is sick, for example, because I've been through what I've been through, I actually have a better understanding of what they've been through and therefore tend to engage with them more about it rather than, you know, we, we tend to say, oh, that's great, fantastic, you're doing well. I actually ask them questions. I actually go through it with them because I've got some understanding for it. Now, if you're going to take me to the question, does this mean suddenly I become a more compassionate person? Am I in a political sense? Well... That's the question. I did ask that, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I've always been a compassionate person in a political sense. And maybe not everybody agrees with my philosophy or whatever, but I've always believed in walking in the shoes of other people and I've always believed in trying to understand other people. And I'll continue to do that and that's what politics is about. You know, Amanda and I every day have to meet people from all over the place and we try and put ourselves in their position and see what can we do to help them. And yes, we fight each other and we have all the political fights, but ultimately we're doing this, we're in politics, because we actually like people and we want to help them. Arthur, we're going to leave the program there, but why don't I just say, as I said before, it's great to have you back. Good to be back. Well, that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Arthur Sinodinas, Rebecca Huntley, Lakshmi Logothusen, uh, Amanda Rishworth and John Rox Roscombe. Thank you very much. You can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live where investigative business journalist Michael West joins Tracy Holmes to answer your calls. Now, tomorrow night, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg will hand down his first federal budget. Next Monday, he'll join Q&A to answer your questions. The media are predicting an election budget, so will it be enough to swing your vote? There'll be plenty of questions to answer next Monday and we'll see you then. <laughs>